opportunity for people to step in. I think in. it is. Thank you. Right, so thank, welcome, welcome everyone to the Revolution 250 podcast. I'm Bob Allison. I chair the Rev250 advisory group, also our advisory committee, and also teach history at Suffolk University. And we're a consortium of about 70 groups in, in Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate the American Revolution. And our guest today is Peter Onuf. Peter is a um, Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation professor emeritus at the University of Virginia, taught there for about uh, 25 years, and previously was at a number of other schools around the country, author of, or co-author or editor of about 15 or so volumes, mainly on Jefferson, also on the American West and on the Amer now the Midwest and other topics, and one uh, probably one of the leading Jefferson scholars in the country as uh, someone holding the Jefferson Memorial Foundation professorship would be. So, Peter, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Bob. Great. Glad to be here. And we know, so, okay, so in addition to this being the 200, three, 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party this year, it's also the 300th anniversary of the birth of Adam Smith. And the year 1776 has a particular importance in economic history, in the history of economic thought, because, can you tell us? Well, there's the wealth of nations, Bob, which is, uh, well, if the Declaration of Independence is American scripture, as Pauline Mayer said, the wealth of nations is, uh, is the sacred text uh, for economists and businessmen, and it's the, a, a great epical moment. So. We like to yeah. celebrate that happy conversion right. of dates, right? That's right. So was there a connection between Adam Smith and his ideas and the American Revolution? Oh, yeah. It's not, it's not direct. Uh, what Smith had to say in Wealth of Nations was that making war on fellow Britons was stupid. Uh, he said um, famously, get rid of or get over this idea, this fantasy of empire. Hmm. In fact, the empire is just coming into in, into focus as what is an empire yes. in the modern sense, aside from alluding to the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. great nations extending their domain over vast spaces. Uh, Smith was no nonsense. He said, listen, uh, this is a stupid war. There are best customers, as you know, Bob, one mm -hmm. third of the exports went to the colonies in North America. So why would we wreck it? Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But he interestingly said, I mean, what's significant about what he's claiming is that they could be incorporated into the British, a greater British nation, you might say. And think of the Act of Union with Scotland as mm -hmm. an example of how British hegemony had spread across the British archipelago. Mm -hmm. And why not even greater? Uh, you mm -hmm. might say, well, there are some <clears throat> state capacity administrative problems with governing distant right. peoples, but of course, the whole idea of modern empire is its expansiveness, that it can uh, surmount vast, dist mm -hmm. uh, vast distances. So he says, uh, bring them in or let them out, one or the other. This halfway position of trying to beat them into submission is counterproductive. It's something like, you might say, Brexit. Right. Over again. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that that is a well-known position of Smith's. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's a political economist. He's mm -hmm. thinking about, as the title of his book says, the wealth of nations. What are the wisest things to do for a trading people in the modern world? And making war on your best customers on... Mm -hmm fellow subjects or citizens, we might say, is a colossal mistake. So we're, we're talking with Peter Anna from uh, formerly from the University of Virginia about Adam Smith. Now, in addition to in Wealth of Nations, talking about the stupidity of the American war, did his ideas have any impact on the people we consider the American founders? Oh, there's no question that these were ideas in the air, mm -hmm. namely free trade. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, you people up in Massachusetts, notorious smugglers, yeah. as we now say disdainfully, uh, <laughs> well, uh, that that uh, that notion of free trade was had a lot of traction mm -hmm. in 
the British colonies because they were excluded from markets that their goods eventually reached. I mean, there were various exceptions to the Navigation Acts uh, of places mm -hmm. that Americans could trade with. Right. Uh, but uh, the idea that there were these limits that were actually costing American merchants, therefore the American people, a uh, considerable amount of the wealth they were generating. There was mm -hmm. already an idea, which is articulated by Thomas Paine, about uh, uh, people eating and needing food, mm -hmm. that uh, the, new, the colonies, the new United States, had a comparative advantage. And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, to open up trade, to break down uh, mercantilism in its various forms, and to enable there to be transactions from nation to nation across the oceans where comparative advantage would hold and the people producing important things would get to their markets instead. Mm. There was a growing idea throughout the late imperial crisis that Americans were paying heavily to be part of the British Empire. And now they were being expected to do still more by mm -hmm. cost of administration, which was serving British national imperial purposes. Right. So there was an attraction mm -hmm. of the free trade idea. I'd like to point out, though, that the people who were really big on free trade were staple producers, largely in the plantation colonies of the South. Mm -hmm. And they continued to be advocates of free trade. And of course, enslavers of human beings and right. producers of slave grown cotton. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea of free trade uh, was a, a powerful one, that Smithian idea. Smith himself thought that the institution of slavery was archaic and anachronism, and any sensible, enlightened person would think that. But his most fervent apostles in the antebellum period were free trading Southerners who knew right. that. Cotton was king. Right, right. And that's why they opposed the tariffs and the other. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So as we know, things are complicated. In fact, that's the big message about 1776. Very complicated. And things are complicated. Yeah. Our yeah. job, Bob, to get it out. How yes. complicated? Why complicated? And this idea that that uh, free trade is the be all and end all was mm -hmm. very powerful in American culture during the expansive period of its own imperialism, you might say, and well into the 20th century. Uh, we're old enough to remember when free enterprise was a good thing. Mm -hmm. was one of the, the rallying cries of the Cold War. We got mm -hmm. freedom. We got God. They don't have freedom. They're godless. Uh, those kind of stark juxtapositions. Right. Uh, but it's been a long time since that love affair with business has soured a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then Adam Smith, if he's just an exponent of that, who needs him? Mm -hmm. It's a question you might ask rhetorically. Yeah. Who who needs Thomas Jefferson? Who needs Adam Smith? Mm -hmm. uh, and what I want to suggest is that in both cases, those are radically reductive readings of these two great and interesting figures. Yes. Uh, and it's worth thinking back to the revolutionary moment to try to get some new perspective on what the message was that was coming from each one of them. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, we can think too about Smith's earlier book, The Theory of Moral Sentiment, which yeah. had a tremendous impact on thinkers then. Uh, I'm wondering if we talk a little bit about that book and yeah, its reception. No that, that, uh, that used to be, uh, Bob, as you know, it dates from our youth. The Adam mm -hmm. Smith problem, of course, say it in German, that's much more effective. Uh, how do you reconcile the theory of moral sentiments with wealth of nations? Because right. in the theory of moral sentiments, uh, we have one of the great texts of the Scottish Enlightenment, which teaches us about this so-called natural sociability, the attraction people have to each other, the spontaneity of society that emerges. Mm -hmm. Uh, because this is our nature. Now, these these uh, universalizing notions of what people are really like and what mm -hmm. their propensities are. Uh, there was a great dream which seemed so ironic on the edge, uh, at the cusp of, of the great age of revolution, 
and including the great age of Napoleon and warfare on a staggering scale, mm -hmm. there was at the core of the Enlightenment a, a feeling that, well, we could give peace a chance, that there yeah. was imminent in uh, the increasing sophistication and civilization, a key word of the Western nation states, and the way they, even the way they made war was more right. civilized, that somehow uh, this was the beginning of a new day. Yeah. In fact, if, if you locate the American Revolution in that context, it's not all about how wonderful we are. It's about the history of the world. And it's the portent, uh, the opening uh, salvo of this new age of yes. liberation and Republican self-government and peace on earth. That's right. I, I always have the melody from Beethoven's Third Symphony going through my mind as we talk about this and say that we have it in our power to begin the world over again. Oh, it was wow. this moment. Pretty John amazing. Adams saw, well, you know, when three million people have their power to create a government. People. That's yeah. right, exactly. So. Uh, I, I think we can, the uh, appeal of Smith and of Scottish mm -hmm. Enlightenment thinking is that it, it gives us a grounding for these fantastic progressive expectations. And I don't mean to dismiss them because if without them, where are we? That's uh, true. But that's, that's the legacy. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's Smith, the moral philosopher, who speaks to us in those terms. That is about natural sociability, mm -hmm. rediscovery of the sentimentalism, the proto-romanticism of 18th century Augustan Britain and the mm -hmm. colonies. Is, is, it's been crucial in our broad rethinking of Western and American history. And that Smith, you may be skeptical about the conclusions you may say, or the premises, I should say, mm -hmm. and of course about the conclusions that the premises lead to. Uh, but as the Beach Boys said, wouldn't it be nice? Uh, and and that's that's the, uh, I think that's the attraction of that Smith. Right. And that's why there has been an Adam Smith problem because mm -hmm. here is a Smith who is thinking about the history of the world. He's thinking in, mm -hmm. according to the idea of, uh, stadial development that is stage yes. of civilization mm -hmm. i think this is absolutely critical uh and the thing about it any modern student of the stages of civilization would say uh, yeah right mm -hmm. it's all about the western european project of world domination uh, and that's true no question about it on the other hand there was an effort for the first time to understand what the engines of change are in world history mm -hmm. and how uh, peoples over time are transformed by the changing conditions of life, by the new means of production, exchange, and uh, what what leads to politeness and civility and, mm -hmm. and all good things that in their better moments, Anglo-Americans and Britons shared uh, the sense mm -hmm. of, of improvement was a key word of the Enlightenment. That's yes. a, a, a very powerful uh, set of ideas, very attractive. And this is Smith standing aside, wisely looking at the American Revolution and saying, big mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the moral philosopher as well as the political economist. It's costing us a lot of money. It's destroying our markets. Uh, but it's also this needless the savage destruction of life and property for what purpose? So come fantasy of empire. So that Smith has a lot of, a lot of traction uh, yeah. and he seems to be at odds with the other Smith. And, and uh, mm -hmm. I think it's important here, Bob, uh, I offer this as another reading of Smith. Smith doesn't think that markets themselves as an historian thinking about how markets were formed in England and later in Britain. It was through the emergence of modern forms of, of state formation of, of uh, law, mm -hmm. so the common law emerging and, and right. uh, uh, it's, and law always has required sanctions. Mm -hmm. This is a simple point and Smith was not a simpleton. He got it. He understood that. 
what we tend to miss when we think about Smith as an enemy of the big state, that is the mercantile yeah. state. Right. That therefore, he's some kind of incipient libertarian or anarchist mm -hmm. who just mm -hmm. thinks you don't need them. That yeah. is fundamentally wrong as a broader view of Smith's work and the lectures on jurisprudence and elsewhere demonstrates. Mm -hmm. He understands that the great challenge is to create conditions under which uh, there will be an arbiter, a supreme authority mm -hmm. who will enable what we libertarian types might think is spontaneous. It's not spontaneous. It is contingent. Those, uh, those that, that idea in the wealth of nations of uh, bartering and trade, the natural mm -hmm. human, the human capacity or predilection or predisposition to do these things. So, so yeah, that's right. It is. But they can't do them right. unless there is law and order. And Very what true. is significant about Smith is that if we plug in what we know about state formation in Europe and in the U.S. in the early period, we understand that this is a, peer, a period not when the state is disappearing. This is when the fiscal military state is gearing up yeah. and its capacity is growing. Again, does Smith get it? Well, absolutely he gets it. The one great exception Smith makes about free trade is that the British monopoly on the West Indian trade has to be sustained because that's where all the big ships go. Mm -hmm. And they are convertible into warships. British right. maritime hegemony is predicated on uh, having the naval capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that we, we tend to miss that. We said, oh, it's he's opposed to the big state. No, sorry, not true. Uh, he thinks that what um, mercantilism and a highly corporatized and structured uh, uh, unfree uh, domain within Britain itself, you need to break down barriers to the rational distribution of resources, the movement of people to productive, to enhance and liberate the productive capacity. That's all familiar stuff that makes sense. But the big difference is between what happens within markets and then what happens outside of markets. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to emphasize. We're, we're talking with Peter Anoff, uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation, Professor Emeritus from the University of Virginia. Now, following up on that, you know, so the West Indies, he sees as essential, the monopoly there. How does he respond, say, to what's happening in India at the time that he's writing Wealth of Nations? Yeah, well, India is a big problem, isn't it? Uh, we're on Another the Adam Smith problem. Yeah, yeah well... Uh, that is a part of the uh, of the World War of 1776. We're not well aware of, uh, and of course this uh, this was an informal, or I should say, um, a kind of uh, South Asia was under the control of the East India Company, and mm -hmm. of course East India Company is familiar to us, uh, Americanists. That's yes, right. Of the Boston Tea Party, things that we've talked about endlessly, and again, it's monopoly. It's uh, uh, in the control of the tea trade. Mm -hmm. This is probably at worst when you could get Dutch cheap, much cheaper, and so forth. Uh, India becomes, of course, the real site for the emergence of the second, what used to be called the Second British Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the idea of, uh, of liberation, self-government, all the things that are ugly about Western imperialism come to the fore in the history of India. And British people... Uh, reform-minded people like uh, um, uh, uh, reform-minded people mm -hmm. were as concerned with what was happening in South Asia as they were with the problem of slavery in North America and the mm -hmm. Caribbean. Uh, I think it's important to have an idea of what was on the minds of enlightened people. Edmund Burke is a good example. Yeah. Um, that is uh, in the Hastings trial about uh, the, the great line and savaging of, right. of India. Uh, there's a term that Smith deploys in the Wealth of Nations that deserves a lot more publicity. He may not be referring directly to India, but maybe he is. But he is making a global statement about European powers in the rest of the world and the savage injustices they commit. Mm -hmm over the world. This is a, a stunning thing for, yeah. for 
or him to be emphasizing. This is Adam Smith as a critic of imperialism. Of course, that mm -hmm. makes sense in terms of uh, monopolistic uh, control of, of overseas markets and so forth. Uh, but it's also quite striking because this is what capitalism is doing. And the new history mm -hmm. of capitalism suggests it's very powerful. This yeah. is happening. Uh, and Smith understands that there's a deep inherent problem on in all this. And this is the big point I want to make about Smith and about Jefferson. The recognition Smith has is that the asymmetry, the difference in capacity mm -hmm. of Western mm -hmm. states compared to not primitive or barbaric societies elsewhere, but societies that have not been uh, developed along the lines of modern fiscal military European mm -hmm. states. States that emerged in a war-torn continent that existed through centuries, right. uh, savaging each other and making war. That's, that's why the law of nations was thought to be progressive because after all the carnage of the 30 years war and successive mm -hmm. wars all over Europe, it looked like there was increasing good sense among enlightened di diplomatists. Uh, surely there's a better way to resolve these things. There's less emphasis on making war, more on the treaties that would create the conditions for peace. Mm -hmm. uh, yet when European states make peace with each other, they do so because they represent credible threats to each other. Compare those treaties and I'm not, I'm not uh, glamorizing what happened in Europe. And of course, Napoleon is the uh, it yeah. is uh, the nation of all that. Uh, but compare that with Adam Smith as he looks around the world. Uh, how does British power, how is the power of the French in West and East Africa, all in South Asia, uh, what capacity is there for resistance? Mm -hmm. you now, this, this is another Smith, because the Smith that we're familiar with is liberated people within markets so that they can make optimal transactions, exchanges with each other. Mm -hmm. But what about collectively when the people of Britain, of course, are constantly in a state of war and preparation for the next war? Uh, they're servicing this enormous national debt because it is the engine that enables borrowing credit is the uh, that, mm -hmm. that's what uh, war making on, on the European scale. Um, and then what does it mean when the British, and of course, as Smith said, we're no longer sending our own people. Uh, we're wealthy enough so that, in effect, war is a, it, it, there's a division of labor within society. Right. And we mm -hmm. enlist people to do it. Yeah. And uh, so that, that uh, growing capacity to make war is what Smith is attending to here. And it is, in a way, the antithesis or the inverse of the dreams for free trade within a market mm -hmm. that's rational and enlightened. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, everything would be fine if every nation on the world had reached a similar state of development. Mm -hmm. Remember the stadial theory about moving from hunting and gathering to pastoral societies onto commercial societies, and we might add a fourth stage of industrial society. Mm -hmm. All of that is happening in particular places. And those particular places have an overwhelming comparative advantage. And of course, he may be talking about the wealth of nations, but he has one nation in mind. And to follow Smith's script is to enable Britain to be the most advanced and powerful commercial society fiscal military state in the world. So this is an mm -hmm. imminent contradiction, you might say. Smith has the formula, hey guys, let's let's be sensible. Yeah. Let's not make war, let's trade with mm -hmm. each other. And that's the great liberal dream of the 19th century. Uh, that is uh, a world of mm -hmm. trade is going right. to be a world of peace. Uh, sweet commerce, the French said during the enlightenment, mm -hmm. this was the great solution to mm -hmm. everything. Yet, even at the same time, as Smithian ideas are implemented all over the world and wherever they're implemented, they enhance the advantage that powerful nations have in relationship to others. So it's no coincidence 
that Smith is both announcing on one level what we might say is the dream of peace and enlightenment, mm -hmm. he and the other Scottish theorists, uh, speaking to a human nature, not a British nature or an American nature. Mm -hmm. And so imaginatively breaking down boundaries, even as they are, in fact, enabling the tightening of boundaries, the erection of, of, uh, of, 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 of great capacity and power to protect and promote national interest. That's the story of na nation state development. Uh, it's that coincidence that I think is powerful because it's happening here as well mm -hmm. as in the British Empire. Well, it is the British Empire. That's right. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're talking with Peter Anna, um, Thomas Jeff Jefferson Memorial Foundation Professor Emeritus from the University of Virginia, author of, among other books, The Mind of Thomas Jefferson and Nations, Markets, and War, which he wrote with Nicholas G. on a is he your relative? He is my older brother. Older brother, okay. Yeah. And you and Annette Gordon-Reed wrote Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of the Imagination. Empire does come up a lot in your work on Jefferson. Yeah, I've been uh, pretty, pretty obsessed with it, Bob. Uh, yeah. That's what I call uh, my book about Jefferson, Jefferson's Empire, uh, intentionally mm -hmm. being a little perverse and utilizing that term. Though, of course, he talks about an empire of liberty. Right. And that's also significant uh, because what the Americans are trying to do, of course, is get empire right. Mm -hmm. They think that British policymakers have messed it up, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, throttling expansive development is a mistake uh, and so forth. So uh, but the theme that I think connects Smith with Jefferson uh, is not an obvious one, and you don't see it elsewhere, but I'm telling you, and you can tell the whole world, Bob, uh, and that is uh, is the theme of, of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is what Jefferson is about is, um, of course, from, in a familiar sense, to vindicate the rights of British people or mm -hmm. men in America. That's what we know that you, you, you utilizing natural rights theory and so forth. Uh, but it's really within an imperial framework that he's doing that. Uh, and this is where I think slavery should be understood as mm -hmm. a problem, uh, both in Smith's version of the future and history of the world and in Thomas Jefferson's. Uh, Smith recognizes what happens when you're, and he's a realist in this sense, uh, he recognizes how great power will lead to great injustice, savage injustice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence, the most embarrassing part, which nobody can read these days without wincing and get totally upset with him, is when, as we now frame it, he blames George III for slavery. Mm -hmm. As if personally he did this to us, the yeah. enslaved as we now say, how can you say that? Mm -hmm. That's deeply hypocritical. Well, I think what Jefferson is saying is that the problem of slavery, all right-minded, enlightened people all over the empire recognize is an imperial problem. The only possibility of any solution to the slavery problem is coordinated action. Mm -hmm. You might say the coordinated action of ending the slave trade, which was pathetically uh, uh, inadequate to the larger problem of containing or ending the institution mm -hmm. of slavery in America, quite, quite the contrary, as, as you know. Uh, but that idea was not wrong. And if you read that passage about the piratical warfare, warfare is the key term, of course, yeah. it was a pretty good one, too, uh, that George III as the embodiment or personification mm -hmm. of the British imperial state has done this to the poor Africans, to the mm -hmm. people yes. in Africa. And now is turning those people in the form of enslaved people in America into the enemies of their masters. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of a coordinated solution, because after all, there would be no slavery in North America if there were no credit from British creditors to buy slaves, if there were no markets for mm -hmm. slave-produced mm -hmm. goods, 
it's it's uh, that's why the the new history of capitalism say well yeah we we need to know about state policy but the fact is this is this in an inexorable monster uh and uh this is the i think the pathos of of uh, jefferson and slavery and not just jefferson because who cares about jefferson about about a whole generation of americans many mm -hmm. of whom were aware of that injustice oh, yeah. savage justice that adam smith talked about that was a living reality in in British North America, it was they knew it, uh, and mm -hmm. they also especially knew it when it, it looked like those slaves were going to be turned against their masters, as mm -hmm. Dunmore's proclamation in 1775 suggested. Uh, and why not? Of course, mm -hmm. as Gary Nash said a long time ago, these are the, these are the real unknown revolutionaries that is enslaved people. Right. Um, they're going to take the opportunity they have throughout world history, whenever. The great powers are at war with each other whenever north and south were at war in the united states that's when there's opportunity mm -hmm. uh, that's, that, that's not a big surprise to us but what it did was to make the possibility of doing something about slavery within an imperial context that it would have to be the king would have to stop vetoing privy council would have to stop vetoing those early efforts to regulate the slave trade because it was widely thought at this point and the slave trade you'll end slavery mm -hmm. America and Virginia had made we would say pathetic efforts or gestures in this but gesture is probably a nice term uh, because yeah of course these are slave societies and they can't live without them mm -hmm. uh, yet uh, and I think this is uh, my colleagues who work on uh, the first emancipation and anti-slavery in late provincial and early national America would agree there is widespread sentiment and it should be taken seriously. There's been a lot of great work on anti-slavery in the early period. And it is because people perceived an opportunity in a time of global change and the tectonics were shifting, yes and no. Yes, to the point of 1776. And this is why it should be both a day of celebration, July 4th and a day of, of, uh, of uh, mourning. Uh, because that's mourning with a U, mourning in America. You can attribute that to me. Uh, the reason being, once you break away from the British Empire, any possibility of an empire-wide solution disappears because the only way the United States as an entity can survive is by accommodating those people who control the most lucrative parts of the economy in other words, the slaveholders, the slave colonies, slave states, they have to be appeased. That's mm -hmm. why I hate to say it, we're not doing 1787, which is much more depressing than 1776. The ideas were in the air in mm -hmm. 1776. The, way the air was already being drained from the, uh, it wasn't there. The atmosphere wasn't the same by 1787. That's notoriously a period of high realism, compromises, mm -hmm. The covenant mm -hmm. with death, and don't. I mean, I'm, I'm with William Lloyd Garrison on this. Yeah, it's a covenant with death. But I ask rhetorically, what choice did they have? Mm -hmm. You might say, oh, well, they should have just chilled and not done it, uh, stayed in the British Empire. But I ask you to think about the British Empire for a little bit. Mm -hmm. What kind of empire was that going forward in the 19th century? Uh, in fact, according to a, a brilliant book by Lisa Ford called *The King's Peace*. Uh, the new forms of maintaining order in the British Empire from New South Wales to South Asia, mm -hmm. all over the British world were increasingly violent and coercive. Mm -hmm. uh, based on, uh, well, it was the instantiation on the massive scale of Smith's savage injustice. Right. So it's not as if staying with the British Empire, oh, they were the leaders of change. In fact, anti-slavery mm -hmm. is first percolates uh, on the peripheries in North yeah. America. It's it's uh, Pennsylvania Quakers, and you know all mm -hmm. this. Uh, and it's, uh, of course, there's a, a high degree of receptivity in enlightened circles in the metropolis. This is a moment, you might say, that the war interrupted, a moment of thinking and rethinking the foundations of British prosperity, the evil injustice of slavery. It's a moment, uh, you can read all about it in the Jack Green's book uh, about uh, about the coming of the revolution from the British perspective. It was a moment on both sides of the Atlantic 
that was destroyed on the battlefield, even as that battlefield opened opportunities for actual enslaved people. Mm. Uh, again, these are the paradoxes, the problems we have to deal with. 1776 cuts both ways. It's both a liberatory moment. There's no question, because how do nations become modern? How do they create markets? How do they protect their citizens? This is the key thing. Kings offer protection for allegiance. What do you do without a king? Well, we invent something that's, that has all the uh, virtues of monarchy, but we depersonalize it. We abstract it into the modern state apparatus. And that was happening apace in what had been British North America. So the idea of war as being critical, how many people, Bob, think about the American Revolution and think it's all about ideas? Did you ever hear about this uh, Republican synthesis stuff when yeah. channeling John Adams, it was all about the how oh, back in, what is it, 1763, the Writs of Assistance case? Right, yeah. Yeah. And then there, the child independence was born. Yes. Yes. And who needed a war? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If, if it is all about ideas and those ideas are absolutely unexceptionable, then all the other stuff is peripheral. No, mm -hmm. not true, because it's the war, mm -hmm. the war that mobilized us for good and for evil. Mm -hmm. In fact, mobilization is the key. If you can't do stuff, if you can't win on the battlefield, then too bad for you. You're gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're a slave. In fact, mm -hmm. that's the thing that's most offensive about uh, uh, defending, and I'm not defending Jefferson, by invoking the, this conception of slavery as an injustice that had to be remedied. But how could it be remedied? That's the question. Look at that passage in the Declaration of Independence that was expunged, where he talks about piratical warfare, blaming mm -hmm. George Third for what had happened. Well, the key word in that phrase is warfare. Think of it in these terms. Mm -hmm. Smith knows that you have to have the capacity to enable markets to emerge, but that capacity can be turned outward against other peoples. Mm -hmm. The capacity to protect and provide for the welfare of the people is the same thing as the capacity to make war. And what the war, the piratical warfare that uh, he was conducting against African people, he personifying the British Empire, that same kind of war was being fought, fought on American battlefields mm -hmm. long before the Declaration of Independence. Americans were treated as traitors and rebels. It took a long mm -hmm. time in Boston because they, mm -hmm. they wanted to do it right, right. They wanted to bring them back. Mm -hmm. And the fact was, it was clearly true 15 months into the war that this was a war. Yeah. Now, that's not just an obvious point. It has to be emphasized as central to the meaning for, of independence because the meaning of independence is to enable the United States to act collectively as a sovereign power and negotiate treaties with other sovereign powers to try to equalize the asymmetries with Britain. So you have this warfare is the key term. And Jefferson yeah. understands that the institution of slavery is also a state of war. Right. So yeah. You got war all over the place. We're making, we Americans, mm. white Americans, are making war on our enslaved people. And that's mm. the truth. And he says it. Yeah. And there's no mitigation. He's not saying, oh, it's a wonderful institution. It's good. It'll get better. It'll gradually disappear because it's not rational, blah, blah, blah. Not true. He knows it's a state of war. Uh, and it's in that context that you can almost see or understand the, and what I'm describing as the pathos of anti-slavery. Here is a man who is genuinely opposed to slavery, but his great achievement, if it is that, is to perpetuate, protect and perpetuate and expand the ins institution because he unleashes, unleashes all the energies of enterprise. Mm -hmm. Americans to exploit the opportunities of a continent without a sovereign, mm -hmm. a real sovereign. Wow. And so well, that's 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 war, dude. I mean, you can say uh, he's Mister. Yeah, he's Mister Peace. But 
as uh, David Bell showed long ago about the French Revolution, who thinks most about peace but people who are on the verge of making war on a massive scale? We, we, we've been talking with Peter Anna from, uh, actually you're a New Englander, but you, you, you I, I think of you as a, well, an erudite intellectual who thinks uh, deeply about these things. And, oh, well, thank you very much, Bob. But I, my answer, I hate to say it because I don't want to brag about genealogy, but on my mother's side, we're really boring uh, Unitarians from central Massachusetts. Can oh, you believe that? I mean, wow, is there, interesting. Yeah, I would not have guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you so much for joining us. This is a fascinating discussion about Adam Smith, Jefferson, war, peace, uh, commerce, all of those things. And Hope we can continue this at some other point. So thank you for joining us, Peter. Hope to do that, Bob. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you. And I, I want to thank Jonathan Lane, our producer, as well as our listeners. You know, Peter, we actually do have folks all over the world who tune in regularly. And every week I thank some of them who are out there. And if you're interested and want to hear more, uh, send Jonathan Lane an email, jlane at revolution250.org. And he'll send you one of our refrigerator magnets or other Revolution 250 okay. things as we anticipate the... 250th of the revolution the publication of wealth of nations also 1776 was the year david hume died that's uh, yeah. another yeah. signal event in the history of the enlightenment um so our friends in chadsford pennsylvania and camden south carolina in delhi in india in bristol in england you know both places that know something about the expansion of the british empire in farmington maine and here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Chelsea, Westford, Framingham, Lemonster, thank you for listening. And now we will, and thank you everyone in places beyond and between, and now we will be piped out on the road to Boston.